hearty good evening to everyone and welcome to tonight's City of Sioux Falls uh, Council meeting. Today is Monday, May 16th, and I'd like to welcome all of you. I'd like to start with tonight's meeting with a roll call. Councilors Aguilar? Here. Anderson? Here. Brown? Here. Entman? Here. Erpenbach? Here. Jameson? Here. Karski? Here. Rolfing? Yes, here. Thank you, City Council. All eight City Councilors are present for tonight's meeting. We'd like to start tonight's meeting with our invocation. We have Packy Jackie. Pastor Jackie Williams from Iglesia Nueva Esperanza Church here in Sioux Falls. Pastor Jackie, welcome. After uh, Pastor gives the invocation, we'd like you to remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Pastor Jackie. Welcome, everyone, and let, let us all bow our heads. Once again, we thank you for this uh, day. Lord God, our Creator, you have appointed this day for this meeting and we thank you for this day. First and most of all, we ask your direction. We ask that you would uh, bless each topic that will be discussed today. We pray for our mayor. Give him understanding beyond his years, Lord, for the man that you have appointed to serve for a season. Bless all of the city councilmen here as well. We pray for peace among each one of them, uh, the love of brotherhood, and we pray for order in each topic that will be discussed. We thank you once again, and we pray all of this in your most precious name. And we also pray for our city. They will continue to prosper and be the example for our nation. In your name we pray, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I do have a couple of uh, proclamations as to start tonight's meeting. And then also uh, some award presentations. First, uh, uh, the Emergency Medical Services Week uh, is Michelle and Jennifer. Are they here? Great. Great. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Come on up. Chief? Welcome. First proclamation. Whereas emergency medical services are vital public service, whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury. Whereas emergency medical services teams consist of emergency physicians, emergency nurses, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, firefighters, educators, administrators, and others, Whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills. Whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of emergency medical service providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Now, therefore, I, Mike Cuther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim May 15th through the 21st as Emergency Medical Services Week in Sioux Falls with the theme, EMS, Everyday Heroes. I encourage the community to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Congratulations. Mark, you want to bring your tea up? The next uh, proclamation is for National Public Works Week. And uh, Mark, come on in. <laughs> Whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives. 
whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of a public works system and programs such as utility infrastructure, clean water, well-managed transportation, and environmentally safe treatment and disposal of all waste. Whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. Whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and the skill of public works officials. Whereas the efficiency of the, of the qualified and the dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they provide. Now, therefore, I'm Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim May 15th through 21st, 2011 as National Public Works Week in Sioux Falls. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure to announce a couple of awards. Um, and my, uh, great. Um, annually, historic preservation awards are presented to individuals and projects which have demonstrated a commitment to historic preservation through advocacy, education, investment, and service. The Sioux Falls Board of Historic Preservation has nominated two recipients for the 2011 awards. The first. 2011 Mayor's Historic Preservation Award is presented to St. Joseph's Cathedral for the restoration efforts to the cathedral. Designed by noted French artist and architect Emmanuel Masqueray, the cathedral is a blend of Romanesque and French Renaissance architecture. It was originally completed and dedicated on May 7, 1919. The Cathedral Restoration Project not only in, ensures that this amazing structure will be preserved and receive the care necessary for future generations to enjoy and appreciate, but it also allows the full beauty of this unique and magnificent treasure to come to life once again. Congratulations and thank you. Do we have some folks here from St. Joseph? Please, come, come forward. First of all, congratulations. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself to the people of Sioux Falls? Uh, my name is Father Tom Fitzpatrick. I am the rector of the cathedral. And I'm Matt Altoff. I serve as the chancellor for the Diocese of Sioux Falls. Well, Pastor and Matt, thank you. On behalf of the people of Sioux Falls, we would like to present this honor to St. Joseph Cathedral and all of the good stewards that are in, uh, entrusted uh, to, to serve there. Thank you so much uh, for, for your efforts. We appreciate it. The uh, second uh, 2011 Mayor's Historic Preservation Award is presented to Dale and Susan Becker. Are Dale and Susan here? Please, come on up, Dale. I should have did this right the first time, sorry. <laughs> welcome, first of all. It's good to have you, Susan, welcome. Look at the camera. No. <laughs> uh, Dale and Susan Becker for their tireless renovations to the home at 103 South Summit Avenue. Designed by architect Wallace Dow, and built by Cyrus Waltz in 1890. This three-story, 5,000 square foot Queen Anne home blended in nicely with other noted cathedral neighborhood homes of its day. Unfortunately, the home was eventually modified into separate apartment units. However, today, through the efforts and contributions of the Beckers, the house has been restored to a single family home once again. Congratulations and thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll move with tonight's uh, consent agenda. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? So moved, Urban Mox. Second, Karski. Councilor Urban Mox made a motion to approve the agenda. It was seconded by Councilor Karski. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, a roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, City Council. We'll now move on to tonight's regular agenda. Uh, are there any motions on tonight's regular agenda? Move approval, Aguilar. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Aguilar has made a motion to approve tonight's regular agenda. It was seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Uh, would anybody like to have any questions, comments on that? We can have a roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Again, welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. It's so great to have you here. Nice crowd. We appreciate it. This is an opportunity for you to address the City Council on any topic that is not later on in the agenda. Uh, please feel free to come forth. Uh, we'd ask you to keep it to about five minutes or so. Uh, and, and really, just give us your name. That's all we ask. Would anybody like to come forward? Well, very good. Very good. Well, we'll get on with tonight's uh, regular agenda. Item number 13. Petition and appeal of conditional use permit 2010-07-02 in the I-1 Light Industrial District to allow non-ferrous metal recycling at 1305 East 39th Street North, approved at the April 6, 2011 Planning Commission meeting with a vote of six yes, zero no. Good evening, I'm Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services. Uh, tonight we have before you an appeal of a conditional use permit that was recommended for approval by the Planning Commission as identified in the, the agenda tonight. I don't know that some of the newer council members have gone through this appeal process before, but uh, within our land use processes, the Planning Commission has a public hearing on conditional use permits. And unless those are appealed by anyone within the community, they are finalized. Um, the appeal process is within a certain number of days of the Planning Commission hearing. So what I'm going to do tonight is go through kind of an abbreviated version of the, plan, the staff report that was presented to the Planning Commission. And we have representatives here tonight of both parties, including the applicant, as well as the, the folks that have requested the appeal. The conditional use permit was requested by uh, Ron Nedvin, representing Unit Can Company. And they put together kind of a history of, of their business operation. Uh, they've been located in a building adjacent to Falls Park for a number of years. And they have desired now to find a new location for their operation. So actually last year they came forward with a proposal for a property which is being considered tonight up on North Cliff Avenue adjacent to 39th Street. And at the time um, they were proposing to go forward with the project, they decided to hold off for, for the time being. And then prior to the Planning Commission hearing, they came in for a building permit, and based on the information of their operation, which includes crushing or processing, it was determined that they needed a conditional use permit. So they had already acquired the land and looked at this location as a good site to move their business. As they went through the Planning Commission hearing, they described uh, what their business plan was going to be at this new location. Essentially, they collect and process certain types of non-ferrous metals, aluminum, copper, brass, and certain types of stainless steel. Uh, they go out and collect the material and bring it to their site operation. Uh, they also have operation where people can bring it on uh, site. Customers can bring it there and uh, do the collection at their location. They put together a site plan uh, for the new location again up on 39th Street, uh, adjacent to Cliff Avenue. There's one existing vacant building that they would be utilizing on site, and they would be constructing a new building that would be used for their collection and processing. Essentially, the way the new building would be utilized 
is that customers would come in off the 39th Street entrance on the north side of the property. They would drive around the west side of the new building and essentially go inside the building where they would drop off the recyclables. And then they would exit outside the east side of the building back out onto 39th Street. On the north side of the new building would be a loading bays for the material to be uh, shipped out after it's processed. And this site has a history of being used as industrial. We put together some pictures to kind of give you uh, a little history. This is a aerial photo that was taken a couple of years ago. And to get you oriented, the property that's being outlined in red is the location that they would like to move to. Uh, at the time this aerial photo was taken, there, were, there was some outside storage. The commercial building to the left of this is the C store. And then you can see to the right, which would be to the east, and to the south, which would be to the bottom. Uh, it's either vacant or used also for outdoor storage. With the exception of the convenience store, the property is zoned industrial. So this particular land use would be allowed, but because it does involve both collection and processing, it does require the conditional use permit process to go uh, prior to any building permit issuance. At the Planning Commission hearing, there were seven different conditions that were recommended by staff. Uh, all of those were approved as part of the Planning Commission action. And those include things such as uh, a gate for fire department access, a loading space, paving and sidewalk, the fact that the processing operations had to be within uh, the building, fully enclosed within the building. Outside storage had to be screened. And this is also within an area that we call the water source protection overlay. A portion of this property would be over areas where we have uh, the city aquifer. So it would also have to meet the requirements of that overlay district, which it would be in this case. Uh, the Planning Commission, as stated uh, at the time this was read by the clerk tonight, did recommend approval of, with a vote of six to zero. And after the Planning Commission meeting, um, the next day we were contacted by representatives of Fegan Construction indicating that they were not aware that this had gone through a uh, public hearing and that they, they were concerned about this land use being approved and they would like to take it back for a reconsideration before the city council. And just as a side note, I know that the new notification process that we now are using, uh, obviously we have uh, a process that will be automatically notifying adjacent property owners. So I think that's just a another example of, of how that process is going to help these kind of situations. Once staff was aware that there was a request for the appeal, uh, we thought that we would get both parties and sit them down together and just have a face-to-face -face discussion about the unit can proposal as well as the concerns expressed by Fegan Construction. So we had, I think, a pretty good face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Staff even proposed some additional uh, conditions that could be considered by the city council. The fact that we do have a noise control ordinance in place. The fact that we do have ordinances that affect uh, litter and nuisances and rodents, um, as well as nuisance vegetation. All of those ordinances we do have in place and we could certainly make those as additional stipulations or conditions of this conditional use permit. And then we also talked about uh, a review process. There are certain types of conditional uses where in the past the Planning Commission has said, let's bring them back for a six-month review or a one-year review to see if there are any concerns or, or, or problems with the use. The planning staff has a standard operating procedure that after one year of approval of a conditional use, we do go out and do an inspection to see if they are in compliance with any conditions, and then just to check and see if there have been any complaints or other uh, neighborhood concerns that we're aware of. So 
We go through a one-year review automatically, but um, there is that potential that you could say we would like to hear about it after a certain amount of time. And we've done that before for other kinds of, of conditional uses. Um, again, the property that's being requested for consideration is zoned industrial and uh, based on the staff review of the conditional use permit request um, with the stipulations that were recommended for approval, it would meet all the requirements that we have within our review process. But tonight you are being asked to reconsider and again I, th I think it would be good to hear from both parties uh, including the unit can folks as well as Fegan Construction. So that's a quick summary of, of the staff report and, and recommendation that was considered by the Planning Commission. Mr. Cooper, thank you very much. Uh, for tonight's meeting, what we'd like is anybody who is opposed to the permit, the conditional uh, use permit, if you were opposed to that uh, and you'd like to speak to the council, we'd ask you to come forward now and just state your name, please. Mr. Mayor, could I interrupt for just oh, one yeah. minute? Sir, I, Councilor Mbach. I'm just trying to keep up with Sire, and I'm not seeing what Dave is showing us. Is your thing on Sire, what you're doing? Yeah. It's not. No, no, I see it on the monitor. I want to look at it so that I can, because I, I, what I'm looking for, Mr. Cooper, is could you say those, the um, qualifications again, the, okay. the stipulations that were in the original? Yeah, I'll repeat those. Uh, when, the, when the planning staff made the recommendation to the planning commission, there were seven conditions that were suggested, and these were all made part of the planning commission's approval. And I'll just read through them. Number one, revised plans to include a minimum 20-foot wide gate for fire department access. Number two, a revised site plan showing one 14 by 35-foot loading space. Three, paved on-site driveways required unless enclosed by screen fencing. Four, public sidewalk is required, and that would be adjacent to 39th Street. Five, processing operations of the facility must be fully enclosed within a building. Six, outdoor storage of recyclable materials must be within an opaque screened fence or screened area at least six feet in height. And number seven, due to its location in the water source protection overlay district, a water source protection district questionnaire must be submitted, which again outlines how they would comply with that overlay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and just for clarification, that is available online, but it would be under the planning commission portion of Sire and I just didn't pull that part up this evening I apologize thank you for and then I've, me. I've neglected to say that as part of the appeal from Fegan they did include photos uh, of the current operation adjacent to Falls Park again uh, expressing concerns of how that type of operation would fit into this uh, proposed site up on Cliff Avenue Mr. Cooper thank you uh, is there anyone who did want to speak to the council in opposition of the conditional use permit? Ms. Fagan, welcome. Good evening. My name is Jeff Fegan. I'm with Fegan Construction. I represent uh, 10 neighbors in the neighborhood. Some of them are here tonight. Um, we're speaking about unit can and uh, in visiting the neighbors, uh, we accumulated the signatures that you see in your documents. We've been by their existing site, tried to learn a little bit about them. Uh, like uh, Mr. Cooper said, a week later, we did have a sit down with, with uh, Mike Cooper, Jeff Schmidt, Steve Randall, the owner, and uh, uh, guys from my office. Um, we did speak about the ordinances. They're very basic ordinances. Um, most of the time in plan review, we see similar things to this. A um, couple other things I'd like to bring to light. This is zoned I-1 light industrial. And um, the description in I-1 uh, says that, that we do not depend on frequent personal visits from the public. And that's a major factor here with this process. Uh, when we sat down with, with Mr. Nedved, he spoke of... Uh, collection and then there's between 
50 and 100 cars per day, and there are between 15 and 30 walk-ins per day. Uh, on the height of a, it's a six-day work week, and the height of a Saturday morning, I think his record was 200 vehicles or something like that. If you understand the neighborhood, there's the subway, and I think their representatives are here tonight. It's a very busy intersection, uh, especially over the noon hour. There are trucks up and down 39th Street from Hanson Concrete, ourselves, First Rate, DNG Concrete, uh, different manufacturers uh, and providers up and down 39th Street. Uh, when the city bank and the, and the mechanics from the area start coming to Subway and the convenience store there on the corner, uh, it's a very crowded intersection. They've tried to control 39th Street with signage. Um, very difficult, very dangerous, and we're just adding to it. And in I-1, I just, I don't believe that this, uh, all these personal visits from the public is appropriate. We're also trying to create in I-1 I the high amenity industrial development. And while there are, uh, you know, mechanics and things like that up and down the street, I think that uh, there's a better location for this business. You've seen our site, or our photos from the existing site uh, for unit can. Um, you see the material stored under vehicles, outside vehicles, outside the fence. Um, you see the lack of, of maintenance and things like that. Um, we've been by there several times. As I said, we've been talking about this for about a month. Um, I think it's my brother Rusty's second time by there today, and, and both times he was stopped in the, in the street itself. And once uh, they were unloading with a forklift, a, a flatbed trailer in the street, and today I believe it was just someone uh, dropping off materials, and because the street's closed, I think they were turning around. But you know, with that kind of action, and if you see the, the truck and trailer configuration that I've got there, I think they had uh, Sayer and Associates create that. They're, per they're turning into the oncoming lane, and, and I've had a commercial driver's license for many, many years, and it would take many stabs at in and out of that 20-foot drive to get jackknifed around the existing building, the new building, their trucks themselves, and in and out of the, you know, I can only imagine them stopping trucks from Hanson Concrete loaded with concrete culvert or something like that. Now, there's a better configuration. There it is. If you see, if you're coming from Cliff Avenue on your left and you're driving up the hill to the east, you're, you're, in both directions you're in the oncoming lane. So the traffic's a dangerous situation. The noise factor Mike Cooper talked about, but you know, it's aluminum beer and pop cans. They're being flattened and they're being shot into a semi-trailer that you can see outside there, excuse me. Um, the traffic we talked about, um, odor and pests, we can only imagine, but you know, we do some work, heavy rigging and things like that. We've moved balers and things for other recycling firms and, and uh, the rodents run out from underneath these pieces of equipment when you pick them up. And we don't have that in the neighborhood right now. Um, we've been up there for 40 plus years and it's finally, everyone's irrigated and grass is taken care of and trees are planted and everybody's taking care of their property and now that the road's developed, it's a nice street. Um, in our meeting he said he was going to uh, incorporate electronics and plastics in the future and uh, The land just to the south of that, uh, Rusty and I recently purchased to develop a new construction and architectural office. There you go. Uh, Pete and Matto Peterson owned that and we purchased it from them. And uh, this is the second of two major projects that we propose on Cliff Avenue in the next year or so. so with that said, you know, uh, I indicated to the owner we're pretty sympathetic to the situ situation that he purchased the property prior to notifying the owners, but uh, it's just not the right neighborhood for this kind of operation. Um, clearly, as you can see by the signatures, we didn't come anyone, across anyone that was uh, for the business, and uh, there were only a couple of neighbors that we weren't able to contact. So I'm thankful for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Feigen, thank you. Councilor Brown. Mr. Feigen, thank you for being here. On this photo, 
straight to the east. What is on that property there? Uh, to the east to the is east another contractor's shop. I'm sorry, to the southeast there where we see those things lined up. Uh, that's the area of the old tire storage. It is no longer there. Okay. So what is there now, anything? Uh, they're proposing to put in a, 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 a business that takes in auction vehicles and move them in and out. And I think they're online auction. They did a nice Mike job of communicating with all of the neighbors, and they had open houses and, and uh, the good sessions there. That's one of the most frustrating pieces with this, and I know that Sioux Equipment is here and, and others that have signed the petition. Not one neighboring owner that signed this uh, was aware of this prior to us driving by, seeing the sign, and then acting on, upon it the next day. Councilor Rolfing? That was... Uh Basically, my question too. Um, uh, I guess I've got more um, more questions for That's the okay. proponents. Mr. Fegan, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Could I just quickly ask: Was there a notification given to the neighbors via mail, or was it just the sign? Just the signs. This this was before we before started our new process. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who is opposed to the conditional use permit that would like to speak to the council? Very good. Are, is, folks, please come forward. Welcome. Sir, welcome. If you could just state your name, please. I'm Merrill Felt here, and I own Sioux Equipment and the land right across from where the proposal is. And uh, the traffic already. We, I don't think we could afford to put that much more traffic on 39th Street because as Jeff was saying, when you get down to, to Cliff Avenue, it, it ends up a problem because I can look right out my window and see all the traffic going up and down. And there's probably more traffic than what uh, most people realize. And if you're going to add as many vehicles in that area, and especially with the... Uh, with an 18-wheeler trying to get in there and everything, I think it's going to be awful crowded as far as uh, uh, with the trucks coming from the cement outfit and everybody else. So I think traffic would be a, a much bigger problem down there at, uh, at Cliff Avenue because that's the only other way they can go other than going east and then going all the way out to the freeway. Uh, 39th is carrying, I think, more traffic probably today than what it was probably anticipated to. And uh, uh, it was my understanding that supposedly all the owners along that area were contacted previous to this uh, permit. And I know I was never contacted at all. But I, I think traffic would be the biggest problem. Sir, thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak in opposition of the conditional use permit? Well, very good. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of the conditional use permit? Welcome. Hello, my name is Ron Nedvitt. I'm the owner and operator of uh, Unit Can Company. We Welcome. have gone through quite a process getting to this point. Uh, we started this company back in 1978 and it's transformed since then. In 97, Tom, Burnt, and myself uh, incorporated uh, and leased the business from Unit Can Company and it's now R&T Unit Can Company. We're a non-ferrous recycling uh, facility. I'm going over a lot of stuff. I got a paper here and I follow it and that's the way it's going to be otherwise I'll forget something. It's okay. So, Non-ferrous metals are non-iron metals, uh, copper, brass, some stainless, aluminum cans. We do not deal in car bodies, steel, or iron. We buy from customers who come to our place to redeem cash for, redeem cash for their product, and we also pick up from many businesses throughout the city and the area. And we are trying to relo relocate up to 35, or, uh, East 39th Street North. Our intentions will be to have all of the business conducted inside of the building. 
Uh, from the time the customer enters our property and into the business, they will be unloaded. Inside, the customer will be unloaded, scaled, pay for their product, and then they will exit in a drive through fashion. We sort, size, package the product brought in. Our process with cans involves running the cans through a magnetic separator, weighing and running the cans through a flattener, which blows them directly into a semi-trailer. And if you've seen some of the pictures that Mr. Feagan uh, showed you, uh, the land that we're on right now, we've had to deal with for over 30 years of growth. And we've just flat out outgrown it. We've, we're stumbling over ourselves, and that's why we want to move. Um, other materials inside the building are sheared, torched, cut down one way or another, boxed, baled, uh, palletized, flattened, blown into trailers. Uh, and from there they are sorted and shipped on out to various products. None of this product, once it comes into our business, will ever go outside except in a semi-trailer and leave the property. We uh, intend to keep the facility nice and neat and tidy. As I say, nothing will be stored outside. Uh, the, the, we have to work with the facilities we've had to work with the facilities we've had and we've outgrown them. Some of the, if something should get outside of the building, it will be picked up for the end of business at that day and I'm talking about maybe a piece of paper or something like that. None of the material should ever leave the, none of the copper, aluminum cans or anything should ever leave the property, the building itself. On the exist, uh, existing chain look, six foot chain link fence, which is located on the north and west sides of the property, we will be installing plastic slats for opaque screening. On the north and south sides, we will be installing a six foot privacy fence, which will contain everything. The new facility we're building is an 80 by 80 building with 16 foot walls. It will be a, an aesthetic building. It, it'll look good. 100% uh, better than what the old Quonset building that was built back in probably the 30s that we're in right now. Uh, Inside, we will have a, a driveway that is tapered with a drain in it. We'll be able to wash out the can buying area where there is, if any odor, will be able to be washed away. We'll be able to do this year round as we're gonna be insulated and heated, which we are not right now. Uh, as for rodent control, we've had very little problem with rodents in our present location. I, you might see something run through and that's about it. We do not keep traps or poison out. We don't have a cat because there's nothing there for them to catch. Rodents don't like the type of material that we're in. I've never seen a mouse eat an aluminum can or a copper pipe or anything like that. Uh, if we do have any type of rodent problems or pesticide problems, we will call an exterminator and get the problem resolved. Uh, we'll see. In itself, uh, everything else will be concreted. Most of the outside area will be concreted. That will also hinder any type of rodents from coming on in. Uh, I've talked with uh, Lou Ann Ford at the health department, Doug Johnson at the environmental department, and there have never been any complaints of for rodents or pests or anything at our business. Since all of our operations will be conducted inside the facility, I do not foresee that short noise will be an issue. We'll be hanging curtains inside the building where the people drive on in to separate as much as we can uh, the noise and keep it inside the building instead of going out the two doors where the entrance and the exit. Uh, uh, wherever there's grass or anything on the outside, it will be maintained uh, regularly. We're gonna plant three trees on the frontage uh, as we haven't decided what kind yet, but whatever the city, whatever we can come by with the city and whatever's uh, approved by the city. We hired Sayer and Associates to give us the plan for the semi-trailers, and I'm sure that they're an adequate uh, business to be able to do this. As far as going out into the driveway, I think that's a little extreme. If it comes to that point, I will widen the driveway, the gates. Right now, the gates are at 24 foot, we could go another 10, 15 foot pretty easy and make it wider, so there will be no, no one going out into the uh, opposing lane of traffic. Uh, we do do a lot of business, and that's why 
I'm still here. We're, we provide a heck of a service to the city and to the surrounding area. On the busiest days, we do 100 to 120 customers a day. Uh, on a nine and a half hour day, that's 12 point, what, six customers and stuff. But we average more like about 50 or 60 or 70 customers if you go year round. That's fair size, fair amount of traffic for anything. And uh, I believe the idea is to have businesses grow and flourish rather than to stay stagnant and not generate growth and income, ta income and taxes. Uh, we want to be good neighbors and everything else. It's, uh, this was approved by the Planning Commission for a conditional use permit. And that's exactly what we expect it to be, a conditional use. And we expect to be held accountable for whatever is in the conditional use, the noise, the litter, the traffic, uh, whatever. We will be accountable and I welcome anyone to come on over at any time for review. I don't care if they come every month, whatever they want. Uh, we want to be good neighbors and we to the area and an asset to some as it will be bringing some possible new customers to their facilities as well. We are moving out of the Falls Park area which will help bring that area to a more conforming site. And I did go around back in August of last year and I handed out pieces of paper to oh I suppose about 10 or 12 businesses in the area don't know if it was to the owner or whatever and told them that we were going to be going through a conditional use permit which uh, conditional use but it never did back in August and uh, I know that I handed Mr. French one here just about two weeks weeks ago or Frenchy I think is that your name okay and uh, I, I've talked to uh, Brian Wiseman, Wiseman Construction, who's right next door to me, and he's all for it. So is Rob, Robert Mathias, who's right next door to him. And uh, I've dropped off papers, so it, it, there has been some notification. I probably could have done a better job. But that's where we sit right now, and I leave it in all in your hands. Mr. Nedved, thank you. Any questions from Mr. Yes, Councilor Jameson. Is it uh, Ron? Yes. Ron? Well, uh, it seems like first off, I think we could uh, probably add widening your gate, if you're willing to do that, that would help alleviate some of that uh, cross-traffic effect. If you're willing to do that, I think uh, that would be helpful for you. Wouldn't be a problem. And I, and I think it would help at least eliminate one concern that one of your uh, neighbors has. The other question is, how, how much bigger is this new location than your old location? Right now, totally. We're working on about 10,000 square foot inside and out, approximately. The building we're building is uh, 6,400. We have the other building on there that uh, is a total of about 3,000 square feet. And a lot of our uh, area that we use right now inside the building is for uh, the storage of the product that is ready prepared. We'll have semi-trailers sitting there that we can put it directly into. So we'll basically be in real close to having everything that we got right now under, under the, a roof. Inside and out, what we got right now will conceivably be under one roof or two roofs. So the, the trailers that you'll have backed up there ready to get th cans thrown in and things will actually be used as storage. Well, yeah, as we buy the product, it'll go right into it. It's not gonna be stored inside. Reassure us again how, how you're going to make sure that the property doesn't turn into the same situation that you've got now. Is it because you've got all this under one roof and it's better organized? Or what's caused you the problem beyond that you've expanded and grown so fast? What, we don't want to have that problem created I again. I understand that. Okay. I understand that very well. We, uh, part of, most of our problem of being clustered is because we have to move things three or four times to get a job done because we're so confined in places. To get one of our trailers out, we got to move everything from underneath the trailer and put it over to the side so we can get the trailer out and then get it back in, then move it back on out, and then we got to move it all around so we can get another semi in so we can load out scrap. Where this is done, uh, the congestion won't be there. We'll be able to utilize our time in the shop and manpower uh, 
quite a bit to be able to do all this stuff. And the added space, the added height. We're in a round Quonset building right now, and I don't know if you've ever worked inside of a round Quonset building, but you can't get next to the edge very well. And so there's lost space inside of there. Okay. We're going into a uh, straight up and down walls. and so. Councilor Karski. Yes, sir. Ron, if you don't mind, just uh, one or two quick questions. How many trucks a week are we talking about? Maybe three, four three at th the tops. Okay. And right now we ship out one, uh, one to two semi loads of uh, uh, cans a week, and same way as on scrap, one to two. Okay. At any certain time of the day that they're coming and Whenever going? Whenever I call. Okay. Well, I can do it before, before the opening of business, seven o'clock in the morning. I can. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes to flip flop a trailer inside and out. Okay. Okay. And, and do you currently own this lot, or will you be occupying as a tenant? The, the, where we're <clears throat> moving on to? Yes. Sir. We own it. We <laughs> bought it after the city gave us the approval to move on to it. Okay. Councilor Rolfing. Thank you, um, Ron. Um, noise control. Uh, tell me um, why noise is a problem where you are now, potentially, and why it won't be there. I don't is believe noise the... is a problem right now okay. where we're at. Uh, there is some noise. Yes, you're standing over there running cans and stuff like that. One can falling on top of a ten dozen other ones, and uh, just, it does get noisy. And that's it's just part of the thing, part of the system. Uh, we uh, drop uh, pieces of aluminum or copper or whatever into a tub. It makes a noise, a bang. So when you drive on in, we're going to try and have curtains as much as we can to contain this noise inside the building. Don't uh, let it go out the driveway. The big plastic kind of thing, is that yes. what you're talking about on, yes. e on each side? Well, um, just on one side. Because they're, they're driving on in, the, the, north, or the south side is going to be a wall. Yeah, so it'll come in the, from the west and go out the north yeah, or out and the on east. The, so on the north side of the drive-through, except where we uh, unload the product, there will be hanging curtains. Okay, I see what you're saying there. Okay, and then what kind of noise does it make when it shoots it into the uh, into the semi? There's some banging on the trailer to, to an extent. I don't think it's a. You mm -hmm. can, uh, we can stand right out there and talk. Okay. Um, what size? What what is your typical customer coming into the uh, into there? Is it a uh, is it a truck? Is it a car? Is it a is uh, it a the average. Uh, uh, I'd say probably 70 to 80 percent of ours are pickups or smallers. Uh, okay. Once in a great while, we got a van truck. We're limited to how big we can get them in right now. Uh, we only have a, a 10 foot opening uh, okay. height, so it just don't happen. Sometimes Do we have to back some in in our present location, but that's few and far between. And with the new uh, building, we'll have. Uh, the ability to be able to put a uh, put a 14 foot tall trailer. We're going to have 14 foot openings on the uh, door. Okay. So do you see bigger things coming in there then? Uh, I presume so. I hope okay. so. Okay. That's what. What size truck do you about. take out to pick up? Pardon me. What size truck do you take out to pick up from the people that you pick up? Uh, I got a, a three quarter ton Ford uh, pickup. Oh, okay. Just in the back of a pickup. Well, I got a trailer, the trailers that I pull. Okay, okay. And they'll be able to drive right on inside. What uh, uh, Rusty and Jeff saw down there was the uh, uh, ability to be able to unload inside is uh, not possible on a, with a trailer like that. Okay. So we have to, uh, we've had to unload on the street, and this will be remedied this way. Okay. Um, the... Um Sidewalk that you'd be um, proposing to put that you need you would need to put in is there a sidewalk from uh, all the way out to cliff on that? So nope. that there's no sidewalk. No sidewalk. There's sidewalk from, anywhere. So putting having you put in sidewalk won't solve a problem if there isn't one going north. Yeah, there is two right there. There is. Yeah, yeah, there is two. Thank you. Yeah, there's sidewalk going west there to cliff. So that by putting yours, putting yours in there, they would be able to go. Where are the people that are walking oh, up? Where are people going? Uh, they're going to walk in uh, with cans if there are that many. You say there are um, 
a few 10 to 15 or 20 a day that may walk in? Do you th uh, possibly. Do you yeah. think that uh, traffic is going to cut down being yes. up there? Okay. Yeah. I think uh, we're going to lose a lot of traffic. They'll go down to MX Liquors. Down on uh, Cliff and 14th there? Yes. Okay, I would agree with you. Um, but if they do, where are they going to drop off this? They're, they're going to follow the cars. They'll follow the cars. Uh, our policy is you get waited on as you come in, not if you bump in front of somebody. I don't allow that. Okay. The building up front will be offices, I take it? Nope, storage. Storage. Okay. Um, I think that takes care of my questions. You're not going to get a fancy office out of this deal? Come on. I got a, a 25, 20 by 20 place inside the designated inside that's going to be a 12 by 12 office with two bathrooms attached to it, and then we're going to have a break room upside, okay. up on top. That's uh, quite an improvement over what we've got in case you haven't been down to our location. <laughs> a card table and a, and a coffee pot? Well, it's a little <laughs> bit more than that. At one time, we did have an ice shack in there for an office. <laughs> we're, we're not one to really uh, spend a lot of money on Okay. It. Thank you. Mr. Neved, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in favor of the conditional use permit? Thank you. Very good, Mr. Neved. Thank you. Council, it uh, looks like that's it for public input. Would anyone on the council like to make a motion? Councilor Jameson. If, if I could, before please, I make a motion, uh, if I could have Mr. Cooper come up. Cooper. Mike, how could we add a, uh, a, uh, an amendment to make sure that that driveway is wide enough to accommodate semis without causing a traffic uh, overlay or a conflict? How could we make that happen? You would start out by making a motion recommending approval of the conditional okay. use permit. Start there. And then you could add amendments with additional conditions to that motion. I would make a motion to approve. Second, Brown. There's been a motion by Councilor Jamison to approve the conditional use permit as approved by the Planning Commission. It was seconded by Councilor Brown. Are there any, uh, any further uh, conversation on that? Councilor Jamison. If I could make an amendment to have the uh, driveway entrance required to be wide enough the gate and entrance uh, wide enough to accommodate semi-trailers and tractors to avoid a uh, traffic conflict. Cal Councilor Jameson's made a, a motion to amend the uh, uh, conditional use permit, and it was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. I, and Denise, you got that down. Uh, hard, but I'll back Very good. Us. Very good. Is there any further discussion or any further? Uh, yes, Councillor uh, Erpenbach, sorry. I want to make sure it's not Councillor Brown. I'm okay. still, still smarting over jumping on him last week. My question for Councillor Jameson is how wide is that? Do you want to make it wide enough for two semis to pass? I'm not sure. I'm, of course, not. I'm visually impaired when it comes to this thought process. So Ms. how Cooper? wide do we make it? And do we have to say that, I guess, is my real question. Do we just? Ms. Cooper, could you give uh, us some guidance, please? What we would do is if with that additional condition that the driveway would have to accommodate semi-trailer traffic, we would have our city traffic engineers review that okay. for the final design okay. compliance. Okay. Councilor Jameson, Councilor Aguilar, are you comfortable with that? Right. Great. Well, there has been a motion to amend the conditional use permit as approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, if there is no further discussion, Let's vote on the amendment as proposed by Councilor Jameson and seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfin? Aye. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. We now have an amended main motion. Uh, are there any further uh, amendments or any further discussion? Yes, Councilor Rolfing? I'm wondering if we could ask, um, assuming this passes, uh, the, uh, that Mr. Cooper come back and s after this uh, is built and everything come back to us or some way we could get a report back and 
six months or whatever uh, as to how these things are coming along and that uh, all of them have been complied with. Is that be, would that be possible, Mike? You can make a motion to amend the task. No, I don't want to. Just we could do that as a matter of record of the council, or you could add that as another condition. No, I, I don't want to make it as a commission. Six I trust review, you. You'll get back do. to us. There's been a request by Councilor Rolfing to have uh, Mr. Cooper and his team or someone come back uh, six months, if this is approved, six months later to give an, an update to the council. Uh, Councilors, any further discussion or amendments? Here, uh, Councilor Buck. I, I just want to acknowledge um, a couple of things. One, and I know that you know this, but it is really difficult to ignore the, path, the condition of the current piece of property for, for this company. It's difficult. You're in a really public location. Everybody in town knows right where you are. And, and so it, we need to acknowledge that. And we also need to acknowledge, though, that we've got some really strict conditions on this. You know, there's some things you're really going to have to toe the line, and I think Council Rolfing is going to drive up there and check on you. I mean, I, I, I think that's kind of, we're all kind of taking this under our wing. And so I just would encourage you to be the good neighbors that you're kind of telling us that you wish to be. And I would, I would hope, too, that the neighbors that are there already understand that. This is a neighborhood that's changing a little bit, and, and I hope that it becomes a welcoming place for these folks. I, 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 I think that, that this is going to cover it, that the conditions are going to cover it, and I would encourage my colleagues to vote yes. Councilor Buck, thank you. We have an amended main motion. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Barsky? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, City Council. Item 14. New 2011 12 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm winery license for Lydia, for Lydia Investment Corp. Easy Dough Casino to be operated at 2309 West 12th Street including video lottery terminals effective July 1st, 2011, previously licensed as retail malt beverage. Item 15, new 2011, 12 retail malt beverage, South Dakota Farm Winery license for Maine and Maine LLC, courtyard by Marriott, be operated at 4300 West Empire Place effective July 1st, 2011, previously licensed as retail malt beverage. New 2011 12 package malt beverage South Dakota Farm Winery license for Gas Barrel LLC. Gas Barrel to be operated at 2500 West Madison Street, effective July 1, 2011. Previously licensed as package malt beverage. Item 17 transfer of a 2011 retail liquor license from Porter Apple Company Incorporated, Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar. 3800 South Louise Avenue, number 304, to Porter Apple Company Incorporated, Applebee's North, pardon me, Neighborhood Grill and Bar, to be operated at 4001 West 41st Street, Suite 932, including Sunday sales on approximately October 1st, 2011, or upon completion of construction. Full service restaurant, CUP not required, pending final inspection per fire, health, and building services. Item 18. Transfer of a 2011 retail liquor license from Outback Midwest 2 LP, Outback Steakhouse number 4210, 2411 South Carolina Avenue to Outback Steakhouse of Florida LLC, Outback Steakhouse number 4210 to be operated at 2411 South Carolina Avenue, including Sunday sales. First full service restaurant CUP not required. Item 19. Special one-day liquor license request for hy Incorporated, all occasions by hy to be operated at the Delbridge Museum of Natural History, 805 South Kiwanis Avenue for wedding receptions on July 9th and October 1st, 2011. Item 20. Special one-day liquor license request for SMG to be operated at the Orpheum Theater, 315 North Phillips Avenue for wedding receptions on July 2nd and September 23rd, 2011. Item 21, special one-day liquor license for TSK Incorporated Stooges to be operated on Phillips Avenue between 10th and 11th Streets on July 30, 2011 for the Stooges Stakeout. Stogie Stakeout, pardon me. <coughs> 22, special one-day liquor license for SKK LLC Copper Lounge to be operated at the 1st Avenue lot number 1 
110 South Mall Avenue on August 14, 2011 for the summer giveaway party. Item 23, special one-day liquor license request for Washington Pavilion Management, Inc., Washington Pavilion 301 South Main Avenue for various special events on June 4th, July 9th, and September 10th, 17th, and 24th, 2011. Item 24, special one-day wine license for Senior Citizen Services Incorporated to be operated at Active Generations 2300 West 46th Street for the Wine Quilt Show on June 10, 2011. Item 25, amend request approved on 30711 for a special one-day malt beverage and wine license for the Sioux Falls Jazz and Blues Society for the Jazz and Brews fundraiser to be held at Vern ID Acura. 4030 South Grange Avenue, changing the date from June 16th to June 23rd, 2011. Item 26, various retail malt beverage package, malt beverage and package malt beverage South Dakota Farm Winery license renewals for 2011 to 12 to be operated at various locations in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, identified as Exhibit A. Denise, great job. Thank you very much, Lori. Lori Hogstad, City Attorney's Office. Thank you, Denise, for reading through all those. Um, just a couple items to mention. Items 14 through 16 are listed as new licenses. Two are retail malt beverage and one is package malt beverage, adding a South Dakota farm winery license. This is a new license that the state legislature adopted in uh, 2011. And this would take effect July 1st and would allow these businesses to sell South Dakota farm winery wines um, for an additional $25. So very reasonable to be able to add a little bit of wine to their license. A regular wine license is 500. So um, a few are taking advantage of this. Um, and that's why they're listed as new because it is a new category for the state, but essentially they're renewed licenses. Um, item 17 is a transfer in location. Um, for Applebee's, which would take place in October or when their construction is completed. Um, item 18 for the Outback would be no, no move in location, just a corporate restructure. Um, 19 through 25 are all special one days. And then item 26 is the first batch of renewals for package malt beverage, retail malt beverage, and for um, package malt beverage farm winery license renewals for 2011-12. Um, there's a total of 28 on the first list. We will have a very large list on June 6th, and then June 20th will be the list with the underage sales. So I can certainly answer questions on any of these items. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to any of these items? Very good. City Council, any questions of Lori? Move approval, Rolfing. Thank Second you, Councilor Anderson. Rolfing. It, there has been a motion by Councilor Rolfing, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr., to approve items 14 through 26. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Pass 8 to 0. Thank you very much. Item 27. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations for the recodification of city ordinances. City Council, $16,950. Thank you. Thank Ever? you, Mayor and City Council. As you know, our city charter and both state law have us recodify our city ordinances every 20 years. And so this is part of a jump start for the 2012 deadline to begin that technical review by American Legal who review and will make some changes uh, in terms of reorganization and, and some structure and some systematizing of our ordinances. Any questions? This is a second reading. Anyone in the audience want to speak to this item? Very good. City Council. Move, Move to approval. approve Anderson. Second Aguilar. Thank you. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve item 27, seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Any further questions or comments? Very good. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Let us pass 8 to 0, item 28. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the City of Sioux Falls by amending Chapter 5, Alcoholic Beverages. All right, Lori Hugstead with the City Attorney's Office. These are a number of changes to Chapter 5 ordinances. 
And I will just touch on the key changes in the ordinance. The first um, key change would be the fee that will be charged for our new retail liquor licenses. Um, a question did come up last week from Council Member Entman asking me the number of retail liquor licenses we had issued at this time. Um, we are authorized a total of 105 licenses. We currently have issued 93 retail liquor licenses, that leaves 12. We have three that are in pending status. And when we take those three out, that leaves our nine licenses. So the total we have issued at this time is 93. Uh, we probably can't count the three that are pending, but 96 accounted for at least. Um, and the fee that, that the Public Services Committee recommended um, when we met with them last month was to set the fee at $1.25 per person. Um, that would bring the total to $192,360. This was the fee that was set in 2001 based on our 2000 census. A good question came up last week from Council Member Karski as far as how often we could set that fee. I wasn't entirely sure, so we did research that. Um, Gail Eisland researched that and determined that we could change that at any time by ordinance. So we're not tied to the 10 years the, the 10 years is tied to the restaurant licenses, but not to just the regular retail liquor. So at least that's an option. And there are two more names on the list that I received last week. So we have a total of 15 um, interested parties in these licenses. And of course, this is the list from 2007. And when we begin to offer those, you know, we'll just have to see who accepts and who does not. But that's, that's where we're at now. Um, the other key change ties in also with the, with the liquor licenses and the official list, that being that we have given them a time period by which they need to finish the process, and by finish the process, they need to pay for the remainder of the license. They pay $1,500. Um, right now, those that run, you know, 155, they still owe us a little over 153,000, and there's three sitting out there yet. So this would require that within a certain time period, um, depending on if they need a conditional use or they don't, it's, it's a reasonable time period that they do come in and apply and make payment for the license. And then the last uh, change ties into Memorial Day, although not this year based on, on the timing, but in the future if this is passed, it would allow an on-sale dealer or what we call retail liquor establishment to be uh, able to sell and serve um, beer, wine, and spirits on Memorial Day. Right now they can't serve or sell any alcohol. Um, whereas the beer establishments that just have the beer or what we call malt beverage license, they can be open and sell. And then for the package stores, your standalone liquor stores or, or stores that have a grocery store that may have a packaged liquor license, right now they can sell beer or malt beverage only on Memorial Day and this would allow them to also add um, spirits and wine. I can answer any other questions you may have on these uh, changes. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Very good. Councilor uh, Entman. Lori, could you tell oh. me? Oh, I'm so sorry. Councilor Entman, my apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. Sir, please, come on up. My apologies. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mike Walls. Um, currently, we've been in the uh, food, restaurant, and liquor business in Sioux Falls for 25 years now, and um, it's a little hard to come up here and, and beg for to keep the, the, the license fee the same when I'm on the list twice coming up, but um, still the same, just some observations. Um, I think the li whole liquor license thing in the state of South Dakota is, is, is a mess, and I understand you don't have a lot to say about it. The state, the state gets to make those decisions, and you have to live with them or sue over them, whatever it may be. But... Um, a couple observations is um, is that uh, the old the old license holders, of course, paid eighty thousand for these licenses back in the eighties and one hundred and four thousand in the nineties. So I'm sure they're looking forward to getting another forty thousand guaranteed in in uh, the value of their license. Now we know licenses have been selling for more than the one fifty or even the one ninety three, but there's no guarantee that. But there's pretty much a guarantee they won't sell for less than the city sells them for. 
So you're, you're adding to the inflation, and it just keeps getting worse. Where does it stop? I mean, there's a lot of small restaurants in the city now that can't afford to have a liquor license. And you want to get downtown going and involve that. You, part of that you need is entertainment and eating establishments, small boutiques. And there's several of them downtown that would do much better if they had a liquor license. They can't afford two hundred dollars or $250,000 for that. So it's, it's starting to get ridiculous, the cost of these licenses in, in Sioux Falls. Um, Lori said, and I'm, I'm confused on the law, you said you researched it, but the old law was you could only redo this 10 years. I thought the new legislature allowed you to change the pricing every five. And um, we know from the recent look in Brookings, it's pretty hard to go back. They, they tried to reduce the cost of the license, especially the restaurant license in Brookings. They were sued by the local operators and they lost. So you may be able to raise it any time, but you're going to have a hard time going back because you're going to have the same thing here. The people that you just gave $40,000, you're going to have a heck of a time taking that away from them. So just, just to keep that in mind. Um, I've got plans to, to build restaurants. I'd love to save the 30 some thousand dollars Will it make a difference in our plans? Maybe not, but you're, you're giving a windfall to a lot of people. Um, the other thing, we keep raising these licenses from the economic aspect you get three cents in every dollar. You build a $2 million RV, that's 60000 every year. You build a $4 million a year uh, Granite City, that's 120000 every year that you bring into the city coffers through sales tax. Some of those people aren't coming here simply because of the economic condition. They're coming here because they're not going to pay, or their corporations aren't going to pay 250000 for a liquor license. So you're passing up a lot of potential sales revenue. Not that these people won't come here. But I'm telling you, they're going to go to Fargo's, Mankato's, Rochester's, Lincoln's, and even Sioux City before they come to Sioux Falls because the liquor licenses are more favorable. There's, there's restaurants in Sioux City now that we don't have in Sioux Falls. And there's no reason for that except the fact they can't get a liquor license. You can't put out enough numbers out there. That's up to the state to allow these licenses. But this 260000 that the city is charging for a restaurant license that attracts the people like Applebee's and Grand Fries, People don't want those for one reason. A, they're, they're very expensive. B, they have no value because they're unlimited. So why would they want to buy a $260,000 license? You know, that's, that, those things just don't, don't meld. Um, but there's a lot of sales revenue, like I say, left on the table. I guess that's about it. I hope we can hold the price down because we'd like to build a couple of new restaurants in, uh, in Sioux Falls this year. Thank you. Mr. Walls, thank you so much. Good. Yes, Councilor Brown. Mr. Walls, uh, not really a question, but just a comment on the restaurant licenses. Um, I think most of us would agree with you, but there too, our legislature, in its infinite wisdom, set that price. We don't have a choice. It has to be at $260,000 a year because it had to be at the last sale price in the private market in 2008, and that's what it sold for. Uh, very so, well. I'm the one that set that price. Okay. <laughs> so I thought I'm, I recognized I'm aware of it. <laughs> and I kind of did it on purpose. To that, that, you know. A couple of questions. I, would, my, I guess I would like to, there's a couple of rebuttals that came up in the paper. I, um, we talked about, there were a couple of things talked about last time the, um, uh, excuse me, I just lost my train of thought. Um, a couple items in the paper you talked about. Mr. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Well, I went with Mr. Brown. He talked about oh, he talked about the idea of enforcement. He raised the prices should be higher because there's more enforcement. Well, that's charging the new guy that's never been in business and asking him to pay forty thousand dollars extra because the police have been answering calls again to people that bought licenses for eighty thousand and a hundred thousand. I think those you should maybe address and look at your your renewal fees, which are currently started at about fifteen hundred. You know, if you raise those five hundred dollars, you generate fifty thousand a year every year. And maybe you could come up with a program where if the people have a five, five police calls, maybe their renewal fee has to be $3,000. Well, there's more ways to get revenue in, in than, just, uh, than just raising the rates for the new guy in business. So, thank you. John. Oh, I'm sorry. Any other questions? <laughs> very good. Very good. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak uh, on this particular topic that's out in the audience? Very good. City Council, any comments? Councilor uh, Entman. Lori, I have a question, please. <clears throat> the change that 
the committee had talked about for the applicant for it to be paid in full. Can you explain what that, because we have a couple out there that are hanging for a couple of years where they haven't paid for their liquor license, correct? Right, right. And we wouldn't be able to go back and collect those. And, you know, at the time when, when this ordinance was adopted, I guess we just didn't imagine that anyone would be holding on to them. We thought if they were on the list and they paid their $1,500 that they would actually come in and purchase the license and get the business up and operating. Um, one is based on some pending litigation, so that might be more of an unusual circumstance. Um, one has been sitting there at least a couple years, and uh, the latest one is, is the one that came back from Timber Lodge that was issued to Doug Hendricks. He has not um, come in and paid for that at this time. However, he did just uh, make his decision on what, where he was going to uh, potentially place that license. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt and hope that he'll, he will come in soon and pay for that. But there was there is one that's been sitting there at least a couple of years. Hmm. I might, if you, Council Management, if you don't mind, I am speaking to this issue because I did withdraw my liquor license application that I did have that was brought to people's attention. And I might just share um, the reason for the $1,500. There was a business opportunity that we had a number of years ago uh, where we were looking at building a restaurant and we ne needed a liquor license. And they came up with this idea. They had one or two that were coming available and they had so many people that wanted this that the city came up with this new program of a $1,500 deposit. Well, what happened is that, of course, we didn't win the lottery. But we did pay a $1,500 non-refundable deposit. So if it's non-refundable and you can leave your list name on the list, why not do that? I mean, that was a business decision at the time. Things change. And of course, the business opportunity doesn't exist as somebody brought to my attention. And we withdrew it because it was the right thing to do. And we had no plans to utilize that. So therefore, the name was list left on there. I also made a comment once about franchisees not coming in coming in because they're the only ones that could do that. You got to understand, I mean, chains coming in. And I think Mr. Waltz brought that up, that most of the operations we have in the city of Sioux Falls are franchise type operations. There might be a chain out there, uh, like an Applebee's, for example, mm -hmm. or a, a concept, a new concept that comes out. And, and a local entrepreneur, you know, decides if that's the right business decision for them to make when they go forward with this. I am a little bit concerned because we have talked about the boutique places that we'd like to see set up and around, around town, and these are the mom and pop operations and local operations. So sometimes, you know, is that investment of 193000 or $194,000, is that something that's going to hold them back or not? We do have a large number of people that are on the list. There's no doubt about it. So it doesn't seem to be a hindrance, quite honestly, uh, when you look at the list that we do have. But I am really concerned about that, and I know a number of people worked hard. Vernon, I think you were, Councilor Brown, in, involved with some of those discussions in the press about trying to change the law in Pierre, and it just, nothing has just ever come of it. So, uh, it, just some comments that I have, that I had, I'm sorry. Councilor Erbenbach. My question, because Councilor Antonman and I talked about it a little bit the other day, was that idea of the renewal fee, and Mr. Walls brought it up as well. Is that set by state law, or is that something we can tweak on the city level? That's set by state law, so we so would that, have to request a change on the state level. Because he has some valid points, right? You know, in terms of that right. renewal, you know, and 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 that two hundred sixty thousand dollar, the annual or the the restaurant, the full service restaurant one, that's set by the state too. You know, so we take a lot of heat for being the bad guy, but we sorry, do. we didn't we're, set the law. Yeah, we're tied to to most of that. This is the only license of all those that that we issue that we have any control over the price. The rest are all mandated at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. Lori, if you could quickly explain how the state allows us to set the liquor licenses sure. and then what ours is at set at right now, right. please. Um, what we do is we take the population. So our new population is 153,888. For the first 1,000 of our population, we're able to issue three licenses. So that brings us to 152,888. We then divide that by 1,500. So for, we get one license for every additional 1,500 people. And then we can take the remaining fraction and add one more license. And that's where we come up with 105. And that is certified by the state. And then in the even numbered years of our census, um, we also get 
a, um, an estimate from the U.S. Census Bureau, and we can use 90% of that estimate to issue additional licenses. Um, we've talked about that 90% number, and I believe it's at 90% because there's that error, margin error, so that we don't over um, over-authorize licenses, but in this case, um, we seem to be right on par, and we're able to receive nine additional. Okay. And then again, what are we? What are, <coughs> excuse me, as, before we uh, renew this or whatever, what is the uh, charge right now that we're charging between a dollar and a dollar twenty-five? Oh, right now we charge a dollar <coughs> twenty-five, and then I asked that it be rounded up at the time, so it's one hundred and fifty-five thousand even. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Karski. Yes, a couple things. I mean, we're, we're dealing, quite frankly, like Mr. Walt said, with a simple law of supply and demand. We have a limited number of supply, and, and the demand is kind of pushing the price higher than what maybe the state would, um, or higher than even what we're charging. I'm curious, uh, though, we said we have how many on the waiting list? 14? We have 15 now. 15. But some of those have been there for four and five years. We don't, right. kind of like Councilman Eneman said, is their interest still there? We have no way of knowing is there no. that interest there. I really won't know until I start making phone calls. And we could end up right. with a surplus of licenses. In my mind, I, well, the other thing is back in 2001 when that council then set the price, it's kind of ironic that um, that price would be equal to today's of a dollar. I mean, it was right. basically indexed forward. So sure. are we doing the same thing 10 years from now? I'm thinking that um, we should consider, and I'm not proposing this right now, but I, I'm about to, that we consider a different amount. And we had 155 as a nice round number before. Right. Why can't we have another round number like 175? Um, to, because first of all, we don't know what kind of demand there will be for that supply. And um, second of all, do we have to be that much above what the state is? allowing us to do when we can modify it at any time. Councilor Karski, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I'd propose that we have a flat rate of 175000 whatever that Point of order, we need a motion first. We need a motion to approve first. first. And then Thank you. That's what I was asking. Yeah. Okay, I move to, move to propose, I propose that we help me out here. Move to approve. Thank you. Second, Aguilar. Thank you, Councilor Karski. Good job. There's been a motion to approve uh, item number 28. It was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Is there any further discussion or changes? Councilor Jameson. Lori, I didn't get this to ask this soon enough, but uh, how long will it take you to work through that waiting list? By the waiting list? Well, once this ordinance is effective, I'll start making calls, you know, right away, the very day that it's effective. Um, and I just work my way down the list. And when I do talk to the applicants, um, they can either tell me they're interested in a license or they want to go to the end of the list, which they may get a second call if they're at the end of the list, or they choose to be taken off the list. Um, for the majority, I would imagine if they are not interested at this time, that they would go to the end of the list rather than forfeiting their spot and their uh, deposit. And then from there, we would go through the, pro you know, they would uh, research whether they need a conditional use permit. They're going to need to know their location, their proposed location. Um, if they don't need a conditional use permit, you know, then th there's a whole time frame that I'll go through with them. So once, uh, once we, uh, the effective date of the ordinance arrives, I'll start making those phone calls and um, see, how, see how we do. You, you, Jameson. you could essentially wind up with a group of people who cycle through the list, went to the back of the list, now you're back on them again, and they've got to decide either they're in or they're out. They can't just linger on the list, right? Well, they can linger on the list. It could be that oh. they just say, you know, I really don't want one right now, even if I am at the end and you're calling me a second time, and then that just means we will have some extra licenses. That, that's what I was trying to figure out is how long it would take for us to really figure out what the market is and what what they uh, what they want. Do you have any yeah. insight to maybe uh, if we were to look at this uh, again in six months, would we be too soon? We'd probably have an idea. I would at least know for sure how many have, you know, definitely have agreed to accept a license or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I can keep you posted on where we're at with that. Councilor Hammond. 
I think I'll get this right, but I'd like to amend the motion, changing it from $192,360 to $175,000 as suggested by Councillor Karski. Second, Karski. There is a motion to amend made by Councillor Entman. It was seconded by Councillor Karski to move the dollar amount from $192,360 to $175,000. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Yes, Councilor Rolfing. Um, I think we're pushing pushing a little fast on this. This might be one of our discussions for our meeting next week uh, to talk a little bit about this. Find out. I think it'd be wise to find out what the what the demand on this is before. And if all we're looking for is a round number, 190 might be a better number than 175. So I would urge a, a no vote on this until we find out what the demand is on these on these. There has been a motion to amend. Is there any further discussion? There is not. If we could have a roll call vote, please. We do? Okay. Councilor Bach? Clarify for us again, Lori. Those nine licenses, can we let, are we, are we bound by this ordinance that we're working on right now to, to, to set the price for them? Yes. We have we to are. pass something. Right. Or those nine those nine licenses aren't available until this ordinance passes. That's correct. I have okay. will not be able to offer until they you know, the applicants will want to know the price. Right. Instead of well it could be this or it could be this. Right. Yeah, we need the, the price before I can offer Council those. Rolfing. And the maximum price we can charge is 193. There is no maximum. There's, no There's just a minimum of at least a dollar per person. Okay, so which would be 155. Three. 153, 888. Okay. If you get technical. Councilor Brown. But Lori, as you said, if uh, the market isn't there, we can have a sale price later, right? Sure. <laughs> because we can set we can this. We can change this change price at any time. Yes. Right. And, and mm -hmm. it is correct that we can change it. No, you. I'm sorry, but we did have that research. You can change that. That's the restaurant. Order, that was a order. restaurant yep. one, not this Councilor one. Councilor Rolfing, yeah. any, go ahead. Yeah, that would be the restaurant one, not he, this that's price. That's the restaurant license, Mike. That does that's right. have to stay the same. But Lori, not, just refer to the thank city you. council. Sorry, but but thank not you. the regular retail liquor license. Nice job. Great job. Thank you. I would, still urge, I would still urge that we uh, that we wait on this decision on the price until we find out a little bit more about what the market is and leave it at the uh, uh, recommended rate by the committee. Well, there has been an amendment made by uh, Councillor Entman, and it was seconded by Councillor Karski to move the uh, proposed amount from 192,360 to 175. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Councillors Rolfing. No. Aguilar. Yes. Anderson? No. Brown? No. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? No. Jameson? No. Karski? Yes. That has failed three to five. Uh, we now have the main motion. Uh, is there any further discussion on the main motion? Could I have a roll call vote, please? Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That was passed 8 0. Item number 30. Or item number 29. Second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations, parks and recreations, $197,000. Thank you. Ms. Kearney, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, this item would give the department uh, the budget authority to use $197,000 in donated funds for two separate projects. Uh, one of them is the River Greenway project. Uh, Jeff Scherzlick has agreed to donate $157,000 for some additional stone veneer and lighting on some of the retaining walls on the River Greenway projects between 6th and 8th Street. This work was originally bid as part of our River Greenway improvements and um, uh, but was not or, uh, awarded as part of the base bid. Uh, Jeff has agreed to fund that alternate uh, so that we could award that to the contractor. And certainly again, want to thank Jeff for his uh, contribution to that project, uh, really enhanced the, the quality of it. 
Uh, the second project is a new electronic paver directory out at Veterans Memorial Park. When we first started, it was fairly easy to find your paver, but now that we've sold over 1,500 of those pavers, it, it is difficult uh, to find those pavers. And uh, the, the Veterans Memorial Park Advisory Board has heard from quite a few folks out there that struggle to find their paver. And so this would provide a new electronic paver directory uh, so folks could easily find their paver. And the Vets Veterans Memorial Park Advisory Board uh, does have money in uh, the, the account that was raised uh, to help uh, furnish and fund the park. And uh, they are willing to provide $40,000 to construct this directory. And then finally, this all item also acknowledges that uh, our proposed use of the Big Sioux River Environmental Trust Fund, um, our, we would propose to use the balance in that fund, including interest uh, at the time uh, that we close the fund, of course, subject to uh, the district court's approval. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Move approval. Is, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this item before we move? Very good. Please, Move approval, Councilor. Rolfing. Thanks, you. Councilor Rolfing, thank you for the motion to approve. It was seconded by Councilor Karski. Any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Urbanbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? That is passed 8 to 0. Item number 30. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a major amendment petition number 2011-04-11 to Chapter 15.45.070, Plan Development Districts at East 69th Street and South Southeastern Avenue, allowing changes in land use as reflected in the revised sub-area regulations and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition brought by the current owner, Don Dunham, Jr. This area has previously been approved as Emerald Valley First Edition, and this is in the northwest corner of East 69th Street and Southeastern Avenue. This has gone through a couple of different zoning plans since it was originally annexed into the city limits. The current owner is now asking for the land uses to be modified to kind of take it back to more of a neighborhood service center and by doing that, we would modify the number of acres that are currently approved for residential, expand the commercial development, um, eliminate or reduce the amount of land that's for multifamily, and then add additional land for, for drainage and recreation purposes. So the net of effect that we're looking at with this amendment is that we're reducing the low density residential by eight acres we're increasing office zoning by 1.5 acres. We're adding approximately 10 acres of commercial and office use. We're reducing multifamily residential by approximately 12 acres. And we're adding about six acres of recreation conservation zoning. And again, we're, we're kind of taking this back to really one of the earlier versions of, of this development as a neighborhood service center. Council, this is a first reading. Any um, media questions for Mike? Very good. Would, would anybody like to set a hearing and second reading for Monday, June 6th at 7 p.m. for item number 30? So I have a question, if I may oh, first. I'm sorry, Councilor Brown. Is there any reason why we can't take the next 30 and 31 together since they're both for the same evening? Denise? One, one of the things. I, I, we actually have I items probably, 30 through 35. That, Deborah, are you sure? Councilor Brown, a while back we had chatted about uh, these <coughs> first readings and it was recommended at that time that the council may have questions uh, at the first reading and, and at that time there was a decision made by the council team to address them one by one. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that was why it was done. But uh, uh, would anybody like to set that hearing? So move, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, Jr. has made that motion. It was uh, seconded by Councilor Rolfing. Uh, is there any further commentary? If I could have a roll call, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Antiman? Yes. Erbenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That's past 8 0, item 31. First reading An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 708 South Spring Avenue from the RD Residential District to the C 2. General Commercial District Petition Number 2011-04-14 to 
and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls, the Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition brought to us by Sam Assam, representing the property owners, as well as Verizon Wireless. This is a small tract of land that's approximately 40 feet square in size. It's located between Spring Avenue and Minnesota Avenue, north of 16th Street and south of the railroad uh, right away. It historically has been used as a small uh, parking area as part of a automobile sales lot. It is currently zoned residential, and according to our zoning ordinance by conditional use, it can be used uh, as part of the, the car lot sales. Verizon Wireless has identified this particular area as a site that they would like to install a 100-foot high telecommunications tower that would require a separate conditional use permit that would go through Planning Commission uh, consideration. The zoning would have to be changed to commercial in order to allow for the telecommunications tower to be considered. So again, this, this request is to change that little 40-foot square from residential to commercial to allow for the consideration of the, the future tower site. Mr. Mayor, Council. I'm going yeah, to excuse Brown. myself from this vote because Thank of where I work. Thank you, Councilor Brown. Councilor Rolfing. Um, Mr. Cooper, do you see any, um, any problems with um, the height of that tower and I'm thinking airplanes, uh, Sioux Valley, be, or I mean Sanford being so close, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, we, we take those through as part of the conditional use permit. They go through more of an extensive review process. Okay. But just initially, I'm not aware of any uh, concerns that would be brought up because of the height of the tower. Okay. But that would go through a more detailed review. Approximately how tall, is, you know, a regular water tower, how tall is that? Um, those can be, you know, a 100-foot tower is a 10-story building. So like the downtown you have... Um, U.S. Bank. Um, this is a pretty good sized yeah, structure it's, they're it's talking a tall about. Structure. Okay. Um, but we do have elevated storage tanks that would be close to that height. And maybe if you go out Friday to the Western Heights Tower when you climb up it, you can see how high it really is. I'm more thinking <laughs> aesthetics and, okay. and that kind of thing. But yeah, thank you. Councilor Jameson. Mike, I was just thinking, uh, why is it that they're so interested in this spot? It seems kind of funny. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> apparently they've identified that there's a gap in service. Okay. And it is difficult to find locations for these telecommunication towers. Uh, I believe they've just pinpointed this as a location that meets their requirements. If, if uh, I live near another tower and it's kind of all zoned off in a circle, just like you've got on your map yeah. here, where if this thing were to fall, it would never hit anything in any direction. But I could see this 100 feet tall could cover a couple of homes, but is that a concern that will be covered later in the planning? Right. Okay. And, and of course, at second reading, we will have the applicant here to okay. be able to answer more questions. Councilor uh, Rolfing. In the planning and the planning and zoning thing, that, that will go through our new process then? Yes. Super. Yes. City Council, would anybody like to set a uh, hearing and second reading for Monday, June 6th for item 31? So moved, Antiman. Second, Anderson. Councilor Anderson made that motion. Second by Councilor Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Antiman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 32. Second read, uh, pardon me, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Rezoning property at East 69th Street and South Bonson Avenue from the RS-2 Residential District to the RA-1 Residential District and the S Institutional District, petition number 2011-04-01 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls, the Planning Commission recommends approval. Scott Gilbert is the owner of record. This is part of the development that has been called Whispering Woods South. It's located uh, on East 69th and Bonson south of 69th and east of Bonson. They're looking at a different concept for this neighborhood that would change it from just single family residential to more higher density residential and also allowing for some institutional uses. Um, and again, this is one that uh, we will be having the petitioner 
at second reading to give the council a little more explanation of what the proposed plans are. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Mike, is there any kind of work the city's gonna have to do to make sure that property is ready for the developer? Um, you know, we've, we've got the East 69th Street underway now, um, over towards Southeastern Avenue, and we would be working with the petitioner to, as depending on the timing of the development, uh, to see whatever infrastructure needs that they would have. But I would see this fitting into any type of normal development. Our utilities are already running through there and everything. But, yeah, they so would be we'll... available to serve this area. Okay, thank Council you. Councilor Rolfing. Um, you indicated that they're, they'll come to us next time and tell us more about what's going on, but yes. that's gonna be more of a time for public input. Why can't they give that to us now? Uh, first reading first has reading. historically just been for the staff report. And, and for the council. For public input. And we don't get as much input then, or we can discuss it ourselves at the next one then, right? Okay, right. thank you. And if there's any specific questions that you want me to convey to bring back, then I would be able to do that as well. Would anybody like to make a motion to set a hearing and second reading for Monday, June 6th? At so moved, Karski. Second, Jameson. Then motion, motion was made by Councilor Karski, seconded by Councilor uh, Jameson. Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Pass 8 to 0, item 33. <clears throat> First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 5800 East Arrowhead Parkway from the C Commercial District and unzoned property to subarea B of the Red Rock Park Plan Development District, petition number 2011-03-14 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls, the Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition by Sam Assam, the current owner of this small parcel. It's about two-tenths of an acre that was acquired by Mr. Assam, and now we're just incorporating that into the other zoning. Uh, there's an existing strip mall that's to the west of this, um, and eventually there'll be another retail use uh, in this general area. So. This would bring all the property under the same zoning designation. Councilor Anderson, Jr. I need to excuse myself. Very good, thank you, sir. Council, would anybody like to set a hearing date and second reading for Monday, June 6th at 7 p.m. for item number 33? So move, Antman. Second, Erpenbach. Motion was made by Councilor Antman, seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. If we could have a roll call, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 34. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at South Grange Avenue and West Village Drive from the I-1 Light Industrial District to the RA-2 Residential District and the C-4 Planned Commercial District. Petition number 2011-04-09 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval. This is a petition by Dunham Companies. Uh, this particular area is located south of 41st Street and east of Grange Avenue. It's approximately 24 acres of land area. It's part of the old Williams pipeline, uh, so it has been zoned light industrial for a number of years. At one time, there was a safety village proposal on this property. Uh, the proposal now is to market this property for both commercial and multifamily residential. And so the proposal would be to divide it into approximately 14 acres of commercial and approximately nine acres for multifamily residential. Councilor Brown. Do you know, Mike, have there been environmentals done on that? Any issues? With yes, um, and from the information that I'm aware of that there are no uh, environmental uh, issues with the city or the state wow. in terms of the, the soil conditions. Wow. Excellent. Very good, Council. What do you mean? I'd like to set a hearing and second reading for Monday, June 6th at 7 p.m. for item 34. So move, Anderson. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made that motion. Seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Parsky? Yes. Pass 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 35. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at West 53rd Street 
and Tribu Trail from the RA1 Residential District to the RD Residential District, petition number 2011-04-13, and amend amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval. This property is located on the east side of the T. Ellis Road and south of 53rd Street. The applicant is John Broke. This is part of the Southern Vistas edition. There are four lots that were zoned, are currently zoned multifamily residential, which is the RA1. Mr. Broke is now proposing to develop four unit townhomes on each of these four lots. And so this zoning would change it from multifamily to more of a, a lower density residential use. Thanks, Mike. Council, would anybody like to set a hearing date and second reading for Monday, June 6th at 7 p.m. for item 35? So move Anderson. Second, Entman. Councilor Anderson, Jr. has made that motion. Seconded by Councilor Entman. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erbenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 36. A resolution amending the 2011 2015 capital program. Parks and Recreation, $197,000. Mr. Kearney, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Don Kearney again, Parks and Rec. Uh, this item is related to item 29, and uh, really the, it just changes the project description uh, for the River Greenway improvements from 6th Street to Falls Park to 6th Street south to 10th Street. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Very good. Council, any questions or motions? Move, Move to approve. Brown. Second. second. Councilor Brown, thank you very much. Has made that motion to approve. It was seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfin? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Urbanbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. It's past 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 37. A resolution creating Sioux Falls Tax Increment District Number 11. The Planning Commission recommends approval. Good evening, Erica Beck with the Community Development Department. If it's okay with the mayor and the council, I'd like to present items 38 or 37 and 38 together. It will require separate votes though. Item 37 is the consideration of a TIF boundary for what we are referring to as TIF 11 and item 38 is for the consideration of a project plan for TIF 11. Just a little bit of background for you in case you're not all experts on tax increment financing. But tax increment financing is an incentive tool that the city of Sioux Falls uses to assist in with the development and redevelopment of property in the core of Sioux Falls. TIF districts capture property tax increase, increases that occur due to development and then use that portion of that increase to reimburse developers or property owners for public uh, eligible expenses as defined by state statute. In Sioux Falls, we have historically used TIFs um, very conservatively and to incentivize the redevelopment of blighted or difficult to redevelop property in the core. We have a total of 10 TIF districts in Sioux Falls right now. This would be our 11th, um, four of which are currently active. The proposed TIF 11 is located within the Whittier neighborhood revitalization area. It's just south of Terry Redland Elementary and just north of 10th Street. The proposed project will include the construction of 52 market rate rental housing units in a total of eight structures. Um, just an example for you, but market rate in this instance uh, means $750 per month for a two bedroom apartment. The property is proposed within the, the boundary as you see on the screen, has a property tax valuation of approximately $295,000 right now, which essentially means that they pay approximately $6,500 in taxes currently. With the improvements that this project um, would complete to the property, the value would increase to just over $4 million and the taxes would increase to uh, approximately $79,000 per year. The developer is requesting a TIF in the amount of $475,000 to reimburse them for public eligible costs, including the clearing and the grading of the land, reconstruction of public sidewalks and access areas, reconstruction of public road access points, a partial cost associated with land acquisition and the construction of storm drainage and drainage retention areas. 
The community development staff has met with Minnehaha County and the Sioux Falls School District to discuss this proposed TIF district and neither have expressed any concerns to us. The Planning Commission reviewed and recommended both items for approval at their May 4th meeting. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have regarding this project and the developer and his representative are in the audience if you have any questions for them. Erica, thank you. Mm -hmm. would, the, uh, would anyone in the audience like to speak to this item before the council uh, acts? Very good. Thank you very much for being here, though, gentlemen. Uh, council, any questions at all for Erica or the developers? Well, very good. Thank you. Would anyone on the council like to make a, a motion on item number 37? Move to approve Anderson. Second, Rolfing. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made that motion to approve. It was seconded by Councilor Rolfing. Uh, any further discussion? Comment? Yes, Councilor Anderson Jr. I went to some of the first meetings that they had with the neighborhood uh, for this development, and I think it will be a great uh, addition to the Woodier neighborhood. And I also hope that using TIFFs, that will take the core out of uh, when we start using TIFFs. I'd like to see them used throughout the city instead of just in one area. I hope, I hope everyone will vote for approval on this. Councilor Anderson, Jr., thank you. Well, Council, thank you. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Uh, we will also vote on 38. Uh, excuse uh, me, Mayor. Oh, Point sorry. of order. I uh, need to read item 38 into record oh, first, please. Sorry. Thank you. Item 38, a resolution approving the project plan for Sioux Falls Tax Increment District 11. The Planning Commission recommends approval. Denise, great job. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, Council, would, does anybody have any questions on item number 38 for Erica or the developers? Move, Move approval. Second. Very good. Councilor Rolfing's made that motion to approve item 38, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, no further discussion. A roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Council, at this time, I'm going to hand over the gavel uh, to uh, the, uh, Council Chair Jameson for item number 39, Election of City Council Chair. Last official duty is the uh, chair. Do I need the uh, clerk to read number uh, 39? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, election of city council chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Well, chairman, if I may, a personal privilege. First of all, I just want to publicly thank Councillor Jamison for the commitment that he's made to the council this year. We had a lot of newbies and a lot of old crusty ones here, so you had to balance that act uh, between us, and, and we appreciate the effort that you put into this, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well I did re prepare a short speech, but <laughs> I left it in the car. Uh, well, thank you, counselors. I, it's been my... Uh, privilege and honor to serve, I guess. Uh, as the chair, I guess if, if I could ex uh, exert some privilege, I would like to make the nomination for uh, a, the a new chair. Uh, this person has uh, served as vice chair and has stepped up to the uh, call of duty. Uh, this person has shown a willingness to serve uh, uh, a willingness to give up her personal time in order to serve the council. And I think the uh, council would be well served in the future to accept uh, Sue Aguilar as a nomination for the chair. I'll second that. Any uh, further comments? We have a nomination for Sue Aguilar for chair with seconded by count, uh, motion made by Jamison, seconded by Councilor Anderson for Sue Aguilar to be selected as chair. We need a roll call vote, please. Councilors Rolfing? Yes. 
Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erfenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Carson? Yes. That has passed eight to zero. Congratulations, Sue. Item 40. Election of City Council Vice Chair. Would anybody like to make a nomination for a Vice Chair? Councilor Intamin. I would li I'd like to, to nominate my friend, Michelle Erpenbach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. We have a nomination for <laughs> Councilor Erpenbach. I need a second. Second, Anderson. That has been seconded by Councilor Anderson. To appoint Councillor Erpenbach as our Vice Chair. A roll call vote, please. Councillors Rolfin? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Harsky? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Congratulations. <laughs> if, uh, if, if if it's okay with the mayor, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, make a motion or uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Motion, motion by Councillor Anderson to adjourn. Seconded by Councillor Aguilar. Roll call vote, please. Councillors Rolfing? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Parsky? Yes. That is past 8 to 0. We are adjourned. Thank you. You know, you just beat the 9 o'clock.